So it's a beautiful morning to be here in Tennessee. Uh, just sitting back on uh, the back patio. Uh, it's uh, uh, a little bit past sunrise. Uh, the sun hasn't gotten up too high yet and too hot. And uh, uh, it doesn't get much better than this. Uh, all the flowers are blooming. Um, when we were in Belize, um, a few weeks ago, uh, it was really cold here in Tennessee, and and nice, nice in Belize, and uh, and we we got to experience uh, lots of tropical uh, flowers, and uh, the crepe myrtles were blooming. Uh, whereas here, uh, crepe myrtles started blooming in June, and it was February. So the, uh, we we talked to some shop owners, and they said, well, we didn't know that that was seasonal. So we're at some other some other places because they bloom all the year there, but uh, here in Tennessee. Uh, you don't get uh, daffodils like these in uh, Florida and uh, other places quite as far south. I remember a few years back we toured Ireland and I kept uh, telling Jennifer, my wife, uh, don't think I've ever seen this many daffodils in my life. And uh, she was like, well, you can't get too many daffodils. And ever since then, we've been planting daffodils in the yard, I think. Uh, the good thing about daffodils is that they continue to replicate and naturalize and they smell good and uh, so they spread and uh, they're even more pretty as time goes on so uh, those are perennial flowers uh, I told I told Jennifer quite a few years ago that I wasn't planting annual flowers because that's continual work but perennial flowers we do the work once and and the work keeps uh, multiplying for us and uh, and getting better and better over time but uh, something I wanted to talk about was a little bit about uh, how we've turned eyesores into something that's uh, that's uh, uh, pretty and uh, and uh, a great feature versus uh, letting the eyesores uh, just uh, uh, continue to bother us and fretting over it um, and when we talk, when we're thinking about Russia and and uh, the supply chain issues and uh, things of that nature, that could be considered a crisis. But uh, in in some cases, there are ways to to benefit from those crises. But uh, this part of the yard originally, when we bought the house, it just drained straight into that culvert there, and it looked really nasty. And uh, what we did was uh, we built up. Uh, this retaining wall here, we, we filled this in and, and we ended up planting. Uh, the, these are uh, Jane Magnolias and Sweet Bay Magnolias. And by the way, you don't see these types of Magnolias, well, not the Jane Magnolias, further south. And so that's another reason to enjoy Tennessee. Um, and so we filled this in and this has become a nice area for us to hang out and build fires and, and things of that nature. Um, of course, we I, I personally planted uh, every tree in this yard and myself except for a few Leland cypresses over there uh, that you can't see right now and I, I had to have help with the magnolia because it was too big but um, this area right here uh, was, was all draining into into the culvert it was a it was an eyesore and, and we built up this patio we originally put in just a few areas for drainage uh, right here and, and over here. Uh, previously, this area of the yard would soak up, would, would end up with a big puddle. So we put this tree here. It's hard to believe that this this maple tree is only about 12 years old. It's gotten pretty big because it loves the water. So it just soaks up all the water there. It's been a great place for that tree to be. There's a drain coming up under the rocks there that surround the maple. And uh, over time, we put in more drains here and over there. and uh, we put in a drain under under the uh, under the turtle there, but uh, the uh, when we think about what's happening uh, overseas and with Russia and with the supply chains, uh, a lot of people really haven't uh, deviated from what they've always been doing with regard to their portfolios. I'm not sure if it's because they don't have a whole lot of um, a whole lot of uh, creativity or they're just not adaptable but uh, it's uh, it's good to make sure that you are adaptable are able to take advantage of, of opportunities when they arise 
Um, something that we did in this part of the yard, this, this area right here used to also collect a whole lot of water. And so uh, we put it, we put in uh, this, uh, this waterfall with, uh, and, and this pond here, and, and this pond fills up when it gets, I don't know if you can see the pond, the pond fills up when it gets really, really uh, wet. And so this fills up, and in this area right here, these uh, Louisiana irises are really nice around uh, May, June time period. Uh, these right here are purple, these are more bluish, and there's some yellow irises that come in in here. Uh, and so we built this pond and built this um, this dry creek bed. It's got a few weeds in it right now. Um, and we put in uh, uh, we had take we took out some Leland cypresses here and put in dogwoods and and this is a tulip magnolia. Uh, if you if you've never uh, been to my house, so you'll know that we really like magnolias here. We have all kinds of different types of magnolias. But uh, the point is, is that we want to take advantage of certain things that some people might consider eyesores. And you could turn, turn a really wet area into a pond. Or you can plant types of flowers that really like wet areas. And uh, right now, with, with Russia, we, we've got, uh, uh, we've got uh, prices of oil and commodities of all types uh, going through the roof. And I don't really understand why... Uh, we left the garage open, but I don't really understand why a lot of people aren't that keen on buying commodities and energy and other things that uh, benefit from inflation. Agriculture prices are going up. Uh, real estate prices have been going up. It's, it's slowed down a little bit recently, but they're still going up. And uh, a lot of people aren't benefiting from that as, to the extent that they could. Um, I know in portfolios, we, we, we're probably never been this um, optimistic about inflation hedges and uh, never owned this much in inflation hedges. Right now, we, in some portfolios, we own upwards of 30% in inflation hedges. And, uh, and as long as inflation continues to, to creep up, as long as we see higher prints, we'll continue to own them. When we start to see lower prints, we may look to reduce that, but we haven't seen any lower prints in the CPI uh, yet. Uh, the PPI kind of came in, the producer price index came in uh, pretty flat this last go around, but the consumer price index was still still up. We were up from seven to seven and a half percent. And so it still makes sense to own inflation hedges and own things that are gonna benefit. Uh, and uh, oil prices are continuing to go up um, as the supply continues to diminish. If we don't produce any more oil here in the, here in the U.S. and we curtail the, the, the shipment of Russian oil, there'll be less supply, so prices will continue to go up. We're over above uh, the, the price worth where we were back in uh, 2011. We're at over 10-year highs right now. Inflation adjusted, we aren't quite as high as we were in 2011, so we've got another 25-30% to go uh, to reach uh, 2011 uh, levels. Uh, inflation adjusted and then and then the only place above that are the 2008 levels and so uh, it could be that if we may reach uh, 2008 levels inflation adjusted would mean uh, roughly uh, not quite a double in, in oil prices from here which is it's hard to think of when you consider that oil prices were in the in the crater two years ago when nobody wanted any oil and people actually paying people not to deliver oil which was kind of interesting with when uh, some people were actually uh, paid people not to deliver oil, the price went negative on some, uh, on some exchanges. But uh, now, we're, now we're going to the other extreme, and uh, it's been, been a wild time. And I, I think that, uh, that it's good to be adaptable, to be creative, to be able to make changes as, as time warrants. Uh, those who are, are stuck in the mud and only think of the way things have always been and don't think about what the future can bring uh, are, are liable to get left to the dust and be really hurt uh, when a new paradigm comes around. And uh, I, new paradigms can be very profitable. Um, and you just gotta be thinking ahead. ahead. Now, now, one month or a quarter is not gonna be 
uh, there are going to be times when you're thinking ahead in, in the next month and the next quarter. Uh, it may not, uh, may not pan out right away, but uh, if you think ahead and think through to second and third and fourth order consequences of what's happening now, you can, you can see what lies ahead. And, um, and I, 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 if you haven't read Ray Dalio's, uh, Ray Dalio's book on the changing world order, I would highly encourage you to read that book because it thinks through the second, third, and fourth order consequences of what lies ahead. It may not be for another two, three, four, five years. Uh, and right now, most people are, are just gonna, I mean, in our practice, we think about the next year to two years, usually. Some people think much shorter term, and I think those people tend to get hurt because it's, it's a whole lot harder to predict what's gonna happen next week or next month or even next quarter, but it's a whole lot easier to predict what's happening four or five years down the road and in the grand scheme of things, and, and one to two years down the road is kind of where the sweet spot is, I think, uh, as far as, as, as our thinking and our practice. But I um, thought, I, thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about um, being adaptable and turning eyesores into uh, great features, turning crises into opportunities. And um, if people are able to do that effectively, I think they'll come out ahead. So. Uh, it's a, it's a great morning in Tennessee, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll sign off and uh, see you guys later.